Hey everybody, I am jumping on here live for just a couple minutes. I don't think this is gonna be a long teaching, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. We'll see where it goes. But I wanna talk about different degrees of demonic influence. I just recently did a video sometime last week on open doors. So you can check that out from, from before. I talked about different open doors to demonic influence. How do evil spirits get into people's lives? And so if you're interested in that, go check it out. But after that, I was thinking about this passage because I read this passage from Matthew 12 and we'll, we'll get there in a second. But I, I thought maybe it'd be good to do a little bit of a follow-up teaching how not every deliverance situation is the same. And I say this over and over again, there's no formula for deliverance. And I, I love teaching biblical principles. I do equipping. I teach keys for deliverance and how to minister deliverance, all that. But there's no formula. And every situation is unique. And we're going to also look in the scriptures. We'll see the same is true in the Bible. Not every situation of deliverance is the same. And there are varying degrees of demonic influence. There is different types of extremes. Some situations are more mild. Some situations are very, very extreme. And so let me start with this scripture. And I, I used this scripture on my last video about open doors, but I want to just kind of dive into again from a little bit of a different, <coughs> excuse me, perspective. So Matthew 12, Jesus says, he says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. He says, I'll return to my house from which I came. So I used that in the last video, talking about open doors, how to the evil uh, spirit, it's looked at, we're, we, we are looked at as a house to dwell in. And so they're looking for entrance, looking for access. And then it says he comes, he finds it empty, swept, put in order. But here's, here's the key verse I want to zone in this time. It says, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. They enter and dwell there. The last state of that man is worse than the first. Okay, so you notice that there is different degrees of evil influence, of demonic influence, even stated in that passage. Because he said, first, there was one demon, there was one unclean spirit that, that Jesus referred to. He said, when an unclean spirit goes out of a person, he's, he's seeking rest. So, so he's saying this demon gets cast out. So in, in the first uh, part of that scenario, the guy had one demon, he had one evil spirit. Right? And then it says it's cast out, seeking rest. He comes back to the house. And then he says he brings seven others. So now there's more evil spirits. But then he also says more wicked than, it's, than, than, than himself. So apparently there's even different degrees of wickedness within the kingdom of darkness. And I don't understand all that, how that works. But Jesus said that he'll bring uh, seven other demons more wicked than himself. And then they all enter. So the guy went from having one demon and then later he had eight demons because he had the one plus seven others. And so his condition then is worse. It says the last state is worse than the first. And so you can see based on this passage that there are different degrees of demonic influence. Not every situation is the same. Some cases are more extreme than others. And I think sometimes we think, well, if, if, if a person has a demon, we tend to think of, uh, we, we tend to use the term possessed. And so if a person is possessed, then, you know, they're, they're completely owned by the demon. But that's not the case. Here's how this works. When a person has demonic influence, normally there's an area of that person's life that that demon is influencing. He's not taking ownership of the whole person, right? That's why in the scriptures, you can see that evil spirits have different functions, so it talks about in Luke 13 that a woman had a spirit of infirmity. So that spirit was afflicting her body and she was crippled. She was bent over. We see, we, we see other demons that are named like a spirit of heaviness in Isaiah 61. That's a spirit that brings depression, oppression. Then we can see a spirit of fear, right? We can see a spirit of divination, right? So, all, so demons have various functions. They have various uh, roles and ways that they seek to influence people. And so when a person has an evil spirit, we don't like to think of in terms of being possessed, like they have total ownership of the person, but they are influencing a particular part or area of that person's life. So to use the illustration of a house, again, from Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says that the unclean spirit says, I'll return to my house. So think of a house. A house has many rooms. A house has many rooms. Let's say there's a house that has 20 rooms or 30 rooms. When an unclean spirit comes into that person, maybe they go into one of the rooms and maybe that room represents 
you know, fear. Again, I'm just kind of making that up, but, but just to kind of, you know, use an analogy. So, so the first condition of the person in that, in that story, the, the first condition of that man, he had one evil spirit. It got cast out. Then it, they come back. There's seven others with him. So now there's eight. So he goes from having one evil spirit influencing one area of his life to now having eight evil spirits influencing all these other areas of his life. So now he's in a more severe situation. And again, that's why deliverance is case by case. Not every situation is the same. And I think there's three main factors that determine how severe the situation is and different degrees of demonic influence. Okay. The first factor is how many demons are present. Again, like in this story, first there was one, then there was eight. So the second condition was worse than the first. Think about other examples in the Bible. Mark chapter one, it said there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. So there was a guy, he was attending the synagogue. In Mark chapter one, starting at verse 21, you can read through it on your own. Uh, I often teach from that passage. But there was a man there, he was in the synagogue, but then he had an unclean, said he had an unclean spirit. So he had one demon. And this demon manifested when Jesus was preaching. He was teaching with authority and the demon manifested and Jesus cast it out. But this was a guy that was able to function in regular life. He was able to attend the synagogue. He was able to probably go to his job, right? We don't know all the details about his life, but he was functional enough to be able to have control of himself to go to the synagogue and, and sit there. And then eventually that demon manifested and, and, he, and it started to kind of show itself more strongly. He started yelling out of the person, but he had one evil spirit, okay? Then we can look at another case, Mary Magdalene. In Luke chapter eight, it says that Mary Magdalene was delivered from seven demons, okay? So the man in the synagogue had one evil spirit. Mary Magdalene, it said, had seven. So her situation was more severe than the one in um, uh, Mark 1 in the synagogue. Okay, so he had one, Mary Magdalene had seven. And then the most severe case that's named in the Bible is in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 is the story of the man with a legion. It uses the word legion. And it, and it describes how this person was living. He could not function in everyday life and society. He could not hold down a job. He could not be, even be with his family. And so he was living in the tombs. He was, he was naked and living in the tombs. People tried to chain him, tried to wrap chains around him because he was probably so violent and just out of his mind. And, and so he was not functioning in society. They were trying to keep him chained up. All that was going on. Um, okay, now he had a legion of demons and that word legion implies in the thousands. Because a legion was a military term for a large troop of soldiers. And some people say 2,000, maybe up to 6,000. So you're, you're talking thousands. The word legion implies thousands. So this man had thousands of demons. In fact, when Jesus cast out the demons and he allowed them to go into the pigs, there was 2,000 pigs in that herd of swine. 2,000. And they all plunged into the sea. They all, they, all, they, all, they all plunged. It shows that these demons were very self-destructive. We know that from the description because the man was cutting himself with stones. He was in torment constantly. So let's look at those three scenarios again. So again, we're talking about different degrees of demonic influence. And the first factor is how many demons are present. The first scenario was Mark chapter 1. The guy had one demon. Probably not a very severe situation. He's probably able to function in real life. He attended the synagogue, all that. But there's an area of his life that came under demonic influence. Then the next case you see is Mary Magdalene. She had seven demons. That's more severe. So she was probably under more oppression, probably under some more torment. She could probably still live a pretty regular life. She could probably still, you know, maybe get a job, but she was probably afflicted, some torment, some oppression that was probably there in her life. Then the third scenario we looked at was the man with a legion who had you know, thousands of demons, very extreme situation, not able to function in real life. So that's like a spectrum, like one end of the spectrum is pretty mild. Now, no, no demonic influence is good, right? There's no such thing as a good level of demonic influence. But the first case was on the more mild side. Mary Magdalene was more in the middle, uh, still, still more mild, but, but more, more extreme. And then you jump all the way over to the man with the legion. So that's, that's a wide spectrum. And so, like I said at the beginning of this video, not every situation is the same. Every situation is unique case by case. 
But the first factor that I believe determines how severe of a situation it is, is how many demons are present. How many demons are present? Okay. Now, the second factor, I believe, is what are the type of demons that are present? Because again, in Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 12, where we started here, Jesus said he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. So apparently there are different types of demons, and some apparently, according to what Jesus said, are even more wicked than others. Now, they're all evil. There's no, there's no such thing as a good evil spirit. They're all wicked. They're all evil. Um, they're all in line with Satan. They all want to bring harm and steal, kill, and destroy in different ways. But, but, but there are different influences and types of demons and apparently different degrees of wickedness. I also think of in Mark chapter 9, where Jesus cast a demon out of a boy after the disciples couldn't. He said, this kind cannot come out except by prayer and fasting. He seems to be indicating a different type or class or kind of demon. So again, we're, we're, we're putting some pieces together here. I'm not saying this is spelled out explicitly, but based on what we can tell, it very much seems like there are different types of demons with different degrees of strength and different degrees of wickedness. Now, as believers, we have authority over all demons, okay? So that's not to elevate their power, but it is just to, to, to go along with what scripture teaches, all right? So, but as believers, in the name of Jesus, we have authority over every unclean spirit through Jesus, through his name, through his word, through what he's done. But, that's, but that can uh, you know, give some insight into why are some situations more extreme than others. One is the number of demons present. Two is the type of demons that are present. And three, I would say, is the level of hold they have in the person's life. Like the, the degree of the hold. Is it a strong hold? How long have they been there? Are they entrenched into the person's life in a very strong way? Because it's possible for a demon to be present in a person's life, but not have a very strong grip on their life. Almost can be a little bit more dormant, depending on that person's spiritual condition, depending on their faith, depending on their walk with God, depending on their submission to God, their repentance. And so it's possible for, for demons to be present, but not have a deeply entrenched rooted uh, stronghold on a person's life, or it's possible maybe they've been there for a long time. Maybe they've even been inherited through the generational line. They've been there since the birth or since the child was young, and they've kind of almost intertwined themselves into the person's personality. And so, so it's a stronger grip they have on their life. This is something I've just observed in ministering deliverance over the last almost two decades, is that in some situations, it seems like the demons just, they, they don't have a very strong grip on the person and you just speak a word, they're gone. And then sometimes they seem to be a little bit more firmly entrenched. And that person walking in repentance, being willing to close the doors. If you missed my teaching on uh, open doors, I did it. Um, just, you can find it on Facebook or YouTube that I did recently, but I talk about open doors. If a person's not willing to close those doors, then that demon can have a stronger grip on their life. And that's another reason why sometimes the, the degree of demonic influence can be stronger than others. Okay, how much is the person yielding? So for instance, if there is a spirit that is lying, like a lying spirit that's telling lies, oh, God doesn't love you, you could never be forgiven, you know, you're, you're just worthless, that's lies, that's lies of the devil. There's lying spirits that, that say stuff like that. But if the believer doesn't believe the lies and the believer resists those lies with the word of God, then it's not going to be as strong of a grip on their life. Now, it's still not fun. It still can be tormenting, and, the, and, and you should still seek to get delivered from that. But, 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 but that degree of hold is not going to be strong. I hope that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, all I wanted to share today was just kind of giving some insight into why are some situations sh more severe than others. And I'm sure there's other factors. Sometimes there's a deeper level of trauma that happened uh, that can you know, kind of open the door to certain things and make it... Um, a more um, complex, maybe you should say, situation. So yeah, there's different factors, but I just named three factors. Number of demons, type of demons, the level of hold the demons have in the person's life. Hopefully that gives some insight. Why are some situations maybe more difficult, more challenging than others? How come in some cases of deliverance, it seems very simple? And then in others, it might be a journey and a process. Like if a person has, you know, 50 demons, maybe in one deliverance session, you deal with half of them and maybe not all of them. And again, it's case by case. God can do, God can move sovereignly. But um, sometimes I've seen it where it's more of a process. There's a progression that happens. And here's the thing. Jesus is the deliverer. Jesus is your shepherd. The, the key is to keep focusing on him 
Keep growing in your relationship with him. Trust him to lead you. Trust him to show you what you need to know. So I, I'm not encouraging you to get all bogged down and try to just, well, I have to have this all figured out. I have to know, well, how many are there? That's not what I'm saying. But, but, but um, keep your eyes on the Lord. Some of this just might be insightful and might help bring some clarity and understanding from a biblical perspective on why some deliverance situations are more challenging, more complex than others. Okay, hope that's helpful. Um, if this is helpful to you, I'd encourage you just to you know, pass it on, share the information with others. Um, you can always check out my resources. I have a lot of resources on my website, which is just my name, jakekale.com. And so I have, I have a podcast. I have actually two podcasts with lots and lots of episodes. I have a couple books on deliverance. I've done some online schools, lots of YouTube videos, tons of free resources. Check those out. And um, I hope that helps if you want to dive deeper into this area of deliverance. I love bringing biblical understanding, clarity, removing the confusion, the fear, and the stigma from this topic. So hope this is helpful. God bless you. And I will see you next time I'm jumping on here. All right. God bless.